Hi, hello, how are you, my weird friends? Welcome back to a Pocket Full of Crime. It is that time again. It's time for you to pour a glass of wine or water and listen to me talk about murder mysteries. But first, if you haven't listened to part one of this mini series, go back one episode and you will be able to catch up to us. I apologize in advance if you hear any background noise. Um, it is raining outside and I can hear the raindrops hitting the window well and there's also a frog in the window well. So don't be surprised if um, he just decides to ruin this audio and ruin my life and by jumping on the window, it's fine. Let's get into it then. You were listening to part two of Dig Up the Backyard. Missing Cal Poly student, Kristen Smart. we left off right when Kristen was last seen, which is odd timing because this crime took place Memorial Day weekend in 1996, which is the same weekend that I am recording and uploading this episode. So to refresh your memory, Kristen Smart was a student at Cal Poly and May 25th, 1996, which was a Friday night, Kristen attended a fraternity birthday party for Ryan Fell, but he was more commonly known by the name Swampy. Now, this had followed Kristen Smart searching campus for a party that evening and not having any luck. Everyone seemed to have gone home for the holiday and the campus was kind of dead quiet. Margarita and Kristen parted ways. Margarita didn't want to continue looking for a party, and she gave Kristen the dorm key to get back into the dormitory building, knowing that by the time Margarita got back, that the doors wouldn't be locked. So they had parted ways. Now, the fraternity house that she ended up at was for Kappa Chi, which was an off-campus house. Kristen had showed up to the party alone around 10 p.m. completely sober, and around 2 a.m., two other students that were leaving the same party stumbled upon Kristen passed out drunk in a neighboring yard to the frat house and helped her back up to her feet and helped her back to campus. Now, the two that had helped her, their names were Tim Davis and Cheryl Anderson. I'm very glad that these two decided to help her back to campus. I don't believe that Cheryl and Kristen were friends or they knew each other very well. I think that Cheryl just knew of Kristen and that she had a dorm somewhat near hers and they helped her back to campus, which is something that if we were to ever find ourselves in a situation like that, um, I would hope that you would do the same thing and help 
a drunk girl or male back to wherever they belong and to safety. So while they helped Kristen up to her feet, remember um, in my first episode, she was not a petite girl. She was a very tall, 6'1", to be exact. So they helped her up to her feet and helped her back to campus. But on their way, a third campus student had caught up to them and seemed very eager to help. And this campus student's name is Paul Flores. Tim Davis did not live on campus, and so he was the first to departure the group once they reached the parking lot that he was parked. Cheryl Anderson was then alone with Paul and Kristen as they made their way back to Sierra Madre Hall, where Cheryl's dormitory was located. I did post a map of Cal Poly's campus on my podcast Instagram last episode. I'm looking at it right now. Um, Sierra Madre was right off of Grand Avenue. I do not know the parking lot that Tim Davis departed the group at, but Sierra Madre is right off of Grand Avenue. And right across Grand Avenue, there is a parking lot or a parking garage, one of the two. And I am not sure if this is where Tim had departed and... The three then walked across Grand Avenue to Sierra Madre Hall, but it wasn't much further if you were headed north. Grand Avenue then turns into North Perimeter Road, and that is where Santa Lucia Hall is and Murr Hall. So Murr Hall comes first if you were headed north, coming from Sierra Madre Hall, which is numbered 113 and if you continue north where grand avenue turns into perimeter road you come across murr hall which is numbered 107 and that is where kristen smart's dorm room was and then 106 is santa lucia hall which is where paul flores's dorm was located and his is even further north than her dorm I mean, it's it's right diagonal to each other, so I'm guessing less than 100 feet. But looking at this map, it does make it a little bit suspicious why Paul said that he took her as far as his dorm when hers would have been first along the way. So from what I understand from interviews that Cheryl has done years later... Um, She does hold a lot of regret for leaving Kristen with Paul, not knowing that this was a terrible evening and ultimately the end of Kristen Smart's life. Um, Cheryl makes it to her dorm, but Kristen's dorm was still a bit further ahead in Murr Hall. Paul Flores' dorm in Santa Lucia Hall like I said, was just a couple hundred feet away. So Paul tells Cheryl that he could walk her the rest of the way. Cheryl later recalls looking back on that night, how handsy Paul had gotten holding up Kristen by her waist. Paul even made a move on Cheryl, asking for a hug and a goodnight kiss, which she denied him. So a drunk girl, unable to walk on her own, is now left in the hands of a boy who had been known around campus for his creepy, failed attempts at hooking up with girls around campus. He was someone who was known to not have limits or know the meaning behind consent. I don't want to beat a dead horse or keep harping on Cheryl, but girl code ladies. Like, he was already handsy with her. She's drunk, can't walk on her own. You make it back to your dormitory and he makes a move on you. I mean, you know exactly who Paul was. Um, Why not just take Kristen into your dorm and let her crash there? And then she could have walked the rest of the way in the morning. But I won't spend any more time harping on Cheryl. Um, I do feel bad for her and I send my best wishes that she doesn't hold herself accountable or feel guilty for that night because she is not the suspect 
from that night. So, however, Paul Flores already had a history of disgusting behavior with women. Another girl on campus had turned in Paul and filed charges for stalking. Paul had appeared in court for the attempt to access a woman's apartment by climbing up her back patio, um to get in through the sliding door. And over the years and swirling talk of Paul's name, other women have come forward alleging Paul had sexually assaulted them, but there was no sufficient evidence to ever put him behind bars. And all of these women had one thing in common, alcohol. All of the victims alleged to have been assaulted by Paul were drunk at parties, um, some even claiming they didn't drink in excess and think that they were drugged, which makes sense why Kristen Smart would have been so out of it that she couldn't walk. Her friends and family that knew her well said she wasn't the type that was a big alcohol drinker. This is unfortunately one of those cases, um, and especially back in 1996, even leading up into the 2000s, heck, even nowadays, um, I still feel like there's still that stigma around sexual assault where people think that because a woman dresses a certain way or because a woman drinks too much that she somehow is asking for whatever comes next after that, which is absolutely untrue and disgusting. Um, that does not give you an excuse to to rape somebody or to take advantage of them. Absolutely not. So let's just get that out of the way right there. And Paul also had a record back in 1996 already for a DUI and probation violation for driving without a license. Um, the girls around campus knew and referred to Paul as Chester the Molester or creepy Paul. Paul did have a speech disorder, um, which made him stutter when he spoke, which as a human, I can imagine that this would cause him to be target to bullying, um, especially being a student in college with not very good grades, like he was just mediocre, not into sports, um, and he had terrible luck with girls. This also could be seen as maybe a motive to his sex crimes, but motive and excuse are two very, very different things, so don't misinterpret that statement. So remember, Margarita gave Kristen the dorm key to get back inside because Kristen had either not had one or lost hers? Well, Margarita went to Kristen's dorm the next day to try and get it back, and she was worried that Kristen was mad at her for not going with her to the party, but Kristen didn't answer, so Margarita let it go and figured she was just sleeping off the night before and would hear from her soon. Sunday came around and Kristen's dorm roommate returned from holiday weekend and was shocked to see the room was left exactly the same. No Kristen. Kristen's belongings were scattered across her bed, um, Us ladies will know exactly what it looks like when we're preparing for a night out. Everything's just kind of scattered everywhere. And this is what her roommate came back to find. So it looked like Kristen hadn't even come back to the dorm at all. Now, when Monday comes around and still no word from Kristen, the girls from the dorm building got together and they all decided that it was a good idea to contact the police. Um, No one had heard or spoken or seen Kristen since Friday night. This is also right around the time where finals were taking place, and so for Kristen to not make it back by the time that school would continue to be in session just wasn't like her. This was back in 1996 when cell phones were still very rare, and So she would have to plan her phone calls home and use the phone in the dorm. So Kristen had attempted to call her parents Friday evening before she went out, but had gotten their answering machine. She left a voicemail and sounded excited that she had some good news and she couldn't wait to share it with them and that she would call back that weekend to tell them all about it. But they never got that call. 
The girls from the dorm did go ahead and contact campus police and expressed their fears that something had happened to Kristen, that she has not been seen. This is absolutely unusual behavior and her friends were starting to get worried. Campus police were not alarmed from the very beginning. Unfortunately, they dragged their feet any way that they could and they lost so much precious time and evidence in the first couple days that she had gone unseen. And they claimed that this was not unusual behavior for a 19-year-old on a big holiday weekend, claiming that she just must have left on a trip and hadn't told anybody, but would appear sooner or later. The rule of thumb has always been 24 hours before you can file a missing persons report, but it had already been three days The parents were notified by the campus police and questioned if they had seen or heard of Kristen. Of course, fear set in because they realized this wasn't like Kristen at all. No matter what campus police thought about their daughter, they knew her the best, and she wasn't the type to leave on vacation or leave town without letting anyone know. She always called, and they had not heard from her since that Friday night voicemail. San Luis Obispo County Police didn't seem very eager to get involved either, claiming it was the campus police authority. The campus police did get around to interviewing those who last seen Kristen that night, including Cheryl, Tim Davis, and yes, Paul Flores. The campus police didn't take it upon themselves to consider the odd black eye and scratches Paul had at the time they interviewed him or get pictures of the evidence while it was still marked on his body. Everyone's stories were adding up and checked out. They all led to Paul being the last person to see Kristen. He claimed he walked Kristen as far as his dorm in Santa Lucia Hall and let Kristen walk the short distance from his dorm to hers alone. Now, I can't say for certain which direction they would have been walking from or towards, but I can say that Sierra Madre Hall is south of Murr Hall, and Murr Hall is south of Santa Lucia Hall. Not very far distance between the two, Santa Lucia and Murr Hall, but if they were dropping Cheryl off at Sierra Madre Hall, they would have had to continue walking north, and if you continued walking north, Grand Avenue then turns into North Perimeter Road, and Murr Hall is actually closer than Santa Lucia Hall. So the fact that he would walk her to his dorm, but it was just like a skip, hop, and a jump further, but still, Murr Hall is closer. So why would you walk to your dorm and then decide to just let her walk back to hers alone? doesn't make sense. He claimed that he slept the entire day. Um, He did get up and shower and they were shared showers within the dorm, but nobody was able to pinpoint seeing him at a specific time showering. And his roommate had also been out for the weekend. So no one can account for when Paul got back to the dorm, if he was alone, if he had left etc. So he sleeps the entire next day. um, And when they interviewed him, he had the black eye. So they asked him how he got the black eye. And he claimed that he had gotten it while playing basketball with some friends. However, when those friends were asked about Paul's black eye, they claim he showed up Sunday to play basketball already with the black eye. So, I mean, I'm no investigator. Well, kind of, just not professionally, but you know. I'm seeing some patterns here. I would imagine that when Cheryl was interviewed by campus police, not only would she tell them that Paul was the last person to be seen with Kristen, but maybe she would have shared a little bit of Paul's background. Um, I find it hard to believe that campus police wouldn't already know previously about Paul's background, and he's already lying to them about this black eye, which in and of itself is very um, suspicious. 
when you have bodily injuries on you and you were the last person to see a girl who has now not been seen for three days. You can call it luck that the San Luis Obispo police had an outstanding warrant for Paul Flores for that outstanding probation violation. And Paul Flores was driven to the police department by his dad, Ruben Flores, to turn himself in. So if it wouldn't have been for Paul Flores being booked on separate charges, the police department wouldn't have had an image proving the black eye and the time frame of the black eye. So I will be posting that booking photo of Paul Flores with the black eye on my Instagram page. The picture shows the date, May 27th, 1996, that he was booked. And it wasn't until May 28th, 1996, that a missing person report was filed for Kristen Smart. It took an entire month later for San Luis Obispo to take over the case from campus police. And it wasn't until 16 days after Kristen had gone missing that Paul Flores's dorm was searched. And by this time, the semester was finished and everyone had moved out for summer break. Campus staff had already cleaned out the dorms and all the potential evidence gone. But crime has a way of following you, sticking to you like gum on the bottom of your shoe. And the scent follows you. Or does it remain behind? The smell of death most certainly, remains behind. Now, if the police department did one thing right, this is one of them. Cadaver dogs were brought to campus, one by one, separately. They were led by their owners, room to room, through the entire campus, every dorm, every hall. The reason for multiple dogs, multiple breeds, different time frames, was to dodge any allegation that the dogs made any errors, or the dogs were led to alert a specific area. I did a little research into cadaver dogs and their training, and they are accurate 95% of the time and can smell up to 15 feet below ground surfaces. Most people believe cadaver dogs are trained to pick up one scent, which would be decomposition, but decomposition of a body is the scent or mixture of scents up to a dozen chemicals, and these are very sensitive to dogs, especially those trained cadaver dogs. So depending on the elements, a body can start to give off decomposition scent as little as eight hours post-mortem. The entire campus was searched and only one room was hit by not one, not two, but three dogs all hit on the same room, which happened to be occupied once by, yes, Paul Flores. Not only did the dogs separately hit on the room, they hit on the left side of the room where Paul had slept. But even narrowing it down further, they hit on a specific corner of a mattress in the room and a trash bin. So this time, the mattress was removed from the room, and new dogs were led throughout the hall, and they hit on the same room, and exactly where the mattress had been previously. As if that wasn't enough evidence, they had also taken the trash bin from Paul's old dorm room and lined the halls with other dorm trash bins to see if the dog would hit on a specific trash can. I think you know what happens next. The dogs led their owner right to the trash bin belonging to Paul Flores. Let me remind you that this is after staff had cleaned the dorms. Imagine the scent or evidence that was present 16 days prior to the search. Was the scent strong enough indicating that this may have been where Kristen was murdered? Or was the scent of murder still lingering on the person? who lived in that dorm. We all wish animals could talk, but unfortunately, they can't indicate who or when someone died. They just alerted that there was evidence of a decomposing body lingering in 
one room out of all the rooms on the entire campus at Cal Poly. We are not done yet. Stay tuned for the next and last episode of Dig Up the Backyard. Next episode, I'm going to get into the newest evidence that has led to the arrest of a 25-year-old case and why there is still no recovery of the remains of Kristen Smart. If you liked today's episode, be sure to share with your friends and hit subscribe to become one of my weird friends. Follow my podcast Instagram where I post pictures of each case so you can put a face to the crime. I hope you all have a safe Memorial Day weekend. Don't drink and drive. And until next time, stay weird, my friends. Oh, and one more thing. Hi, mom.